police are to investigate allegations of sexual harassment, abuse and rape in schools and universities, setting up a dedicated helpline. With thousands of mainly anonymous testimonies posted online, police are asking victims to come forward. We challenge the culture within education where misogyny, sexual harassment, sexual assaults are not condoned, but I suspect on occasions are being tolerated. We'll be looking at why police believe the allegations could be the tip of the iceberg. Also on the programme, a green light for the Greens. Outdoor sports resume in England tomorrow as lockdown is eased. More anti gay protests in Myanmar as 12 countries condemn its military for the deaths of more than 100 people yesterday. And hopes that an evening high tide might help to refloat the container ship blocking the Suez Canal. thousands of allegations of sexual harassment, abuse, and in some cases rape made by young women and school pupils through an online campaign. Many of the accounts concern leading private schools and have been posted on the website Everyone's Invited. A senior police officer has told the BBC today that a dedicated helpline is being set up with the aim both of investigating allegations of criminal behaviour and challenging any culture within educational settings which has tolerated misogyny and abuse. Our correspondent Sarah Campbell reports. A walkout at a North London private school after more than 200 former and current pupils anonymously made allegations of abuse, misogyny and even rape. Highgate School has set up an external review and it's clear many more educational establishments are going to have to tackle difficult issues. In just three weeks, a website set up to allow people to share their experiences of what's being called a rape culture has received more than 6,000 testimonies. At school, the boys would have days where they would go around slapping or grabbing girls' bombs. Some would stand under the stairs rating girls as they went by and trying to look up their skirts. I got drunk at a party and I was assaulted by a close male friend whom I had really trusted. I made it clear I wasn't interested in him and I was crying as he did it. Initially flooded with accounts from pupils from leading private schools, the founder of Everyone's Invited told me that's no longer the case. In the past week we've seen a very significant increase and widening of that demographic in the increase of state schools and universities um, being mentioned, as well as um, you know a wider uh, variety of ages as well, older, much older people, younger people, boys and girls, and I think what this really shows is that this is a universal problem. In recent years, the sporting world has been rocked by the stories which emerged of young boys who were abused by football coaches. The chief constable involved in that police operation is now helping to coordinate the response to these latest allegations. I suspect it's probably going to be the next child sexual abuse scandal that engulfs uh, the nation in the way that the Football Association revelations did. We have a huge challenge and ultimately this is down to parents and guardians making sure that, that their children understand what healthy relationships look like, what healthy sexual relationships look like. And it's so important that schools reinforce that message consistently. A helpline is due to be launched by the Department for Education in the next week for those wishing to get support and potentially report those they believe to have abused them. And Sarah Campbell's here now with me in the studio. This seems to be taken more and more seriously now, Sarah. Yeah, I think it's absolutely right. I mean, really what started as, as one person, Soma Sarah, wanting to start a conversation about what happened to her has clearly resonated with thousands of people. And I think it's the speed and the volume of those responses which has led the authorities to think we've really got to act, we've really got to do something about this, hence this joint initiative between the government and police forces. And it's striking, isn't it, when you hear someone like the Chief Constable, who is the National Police Chief's Council lead on child protection, say that he thinks this is going to be the next really big child abuse scandal the country is going to have to come to terms with. There are already a few police investigations underway into some of the allegations, and I think undoubtedly there are going to be more. Sarah Campbell, thank you. 
Vaccination targets and lockdown easing in England are on track, ministers said today, ahead of a significant moment for the easing of restrictions tomorrow. Meanwhile, the First Minister for Wales, Mark Drakeford, revealed that there had been high-level talks across the four nations about the idea of so-called vaccine passports. Here's our political correspondent, Chris Mason. The green of windy West Yorkshire in spring, the strides towards liberty along putting the preparations in place for the return of golf in England tomorrow. It's a good three months now. We've had members at home on Facebook posting uh, things about the, you know, what they're doing, the chipping in the garden, the putting in the garden, they're putting duvets over the washing line and hitting into it. But, you know, they just want to get up here and start playing golf. You know, they, they want to get out. As well as outdoor sport returning, from tomorrow in England, six people or two households can meet outside, including in private gardens. It'll be another fortnight at least before a haircut can be done by a professional. But... Well, of course they, they could be delayed if the situation deteriorates, but at the moment we are on track. So um, thanks to the work of the British people and the excellent vaccine rollout, we are confident both in going ahead with the, the easings from tomorrow and, and the next stages. There is then the cautious prospect of the streets of Hebden Bridge and elsewhere slowly looking a little less empty. The hope too of normality or near normality by the summer. But alongside hope, jitters from some. I have to say I'm a little bit nervous about a full relaxation in June. I mean, obviously, we all want to relax as far as it is safe to do so. Um, and it will be important that the government continues to be guided by the data in that respect to see. And this is, this is a particularly important thing. Exactly how well are the vaccines performing? If they go on at this rate, I think we can get quite close to a full release. And huge questions spring forth about the tools to help normality return. As governments around the UK ponder whether it's possible, whether it's practical to have some sort of passport that says we've been vaccinated, tested or had Covid. I think there are definitely prizes to be won through domestic vaccine certification, but there are some very big practical and ethical challenges to face as well. The speed and specifics of unlocking vary around the UK. The stay local rule was scrapped here in Wales yesterday. From Friday, the instruction to stay local will begin in Scotland, replacing the edict to stay at home. In Northern Ireland, six people from two households will be able to meet in private gardens from Thursday. Chris Mason, BBC News. So what exactly will be permitted from tomorrow in England as lockdown restrictions are eased? Our correspondent Katie Prescott has been looking at what changes, including the central stay-at-home message and what's still to come. Spring has sprung and the UK is opening up once again. From tomorrow in England it'll be easier to catch up with friends and family, just like in Wales this weekend, when we're allowed to get together in groups of six outside <coughs> or two households. And there'll be more to do locally too as outdoor sports kick off again. Something to keep us entertained, perhaps, until the next key date. The 12th of April in England and a week earlier in Scotland, shops will hear their tills ringing once again as they're allowed to reopen. We can go out for dinner or a drink, but a cold one, as it's al fresco only, and that rule of six or two households still applies. Haircuts and manicures will be allowed, and there'll be more ways to spend our free time as gyms and theme parks reopen. May the 17th, the next big date. We'll be able to go to the cinema again and forget patio heaters. We can eat inside in bars and restaurants in groups of up to six. Outside though, restrictions are mainly lifted and you'll be able to meet in groups of up to 30 people. And if you're dreaming of jetting away, foreign travel was lightly penciled in from the 17th of May, but that's still very much under review. By the 21st of June, nights out in clubs will start again, if all goes to plan, and things may be back to some kind of normal, as restrictions on social contact are scrapped. We may even have seen the last of elbow bumping. Prescott, BBC News. Well, as we've been hearing, there are, of course, different rules for different parts of the UK. You can find out more information about restrictions in Wales, in Scotland and in Northern Ireland on the BBC website, bbc.co.uk forward slash news.
Let's take a look now at the latest government figures. There were 3,862 new coronavirus infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. That means on average 5,355 new cases reported per day in the last week. The latest figures show 4,560 people were in hospital across the UK. 19 deaths were reported in the latest 24-hour period. That's people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. On average in the past week, 62 deaths were reported every day. The total number of deaths is now 126,000. 592. As for vaccinations, more than 423,852,000 people have had their first dose of a COVID vaccine in the latest 24-hour period, and that brings the total to over 30 million. And over 3.5 million people have had both doses of the vaccine. Well, as the number of first vaccinations passes the 30 million point, all those aged 50 or over who've not yet had their first jab are being urged to book appointments. Our health correspondent, Naomi Grimley, is here in the studio. What's the thinking here, Naomi? Well, the vaccination rates for the over 60s are quite phenomenal. 95% uh, of people have taken up their offer and had a first jab. But when it comes to the over 50s, the government notes it needs to do a bit more to reach them. For example, it still needs to reach reach 25% of those aged 50 to 54. And the reason it wants to focus minds is because there is going to be this disruption in vaccine supply over the next month. It's in part because there's been a consignment of doses delayed coming over from India. So that will then have an impact on the younger age groups, on the under 50 somethings. But there's some good news for them today, which is the government confirmed that the Moderna vaccine will be coming on stream at the end of next month. So that will be a third arrow, if you like, in the government's quiver. Naomi Grimley, thank you very much. There's been widespread international condemnation of the military coup in Myanmar after more than 100 demonstrators were killed yesterday. Defence chiefs from 12 countries, including the US, Britain and Japan, have issued a joint statement saying armed forces should protect rather than harm the people they serve. Yesterday was the deadliest day for protesters since Myanmar's coup eight weeks ago. Our correspondent Laura Bick has been monitoring the situation from Thailand and sent this report. My son, my son, why can't you hear me, she cries. 13-year-old Tsai Wei Yang was playing in the street when he was shot and killed. Witnesses say troops opened fire, even though no protests were nearby. His family are now adding their voices to a chorus calling for revolution. These children are in this time of crisis. They kept by safest place in the, by the family. These children are not on the street, not on the front, even not in the living rooms. They are hiding. They are, even that children are not safe. So that means no one is safe in Burma. Over 400 people have now died in Myanmar since the military seized power last month. Some protesters have started to fight back using homemade weapons. But they're no match against trained fighters and live rounds. The US has accused General Minang Line of presiding over a reign of terror. His regime has already been hit by some sanctions, but he still has powerful friends. Russia's Deputy Defence Minister was given a front row seat for yesterday's Armed Forces Day. Other diplomats were also in the crowd, including from China. You undeterred. The will of a defiant people determined to restore democracy has so far refused to bend, even under relentless fire. Laura Bicker, BBC News, Bangkok. 
Here, parents at Batley Grammar School in West Yorkshire have called for calm to allow an incident where a teacher showed pupils a cartoon depicting the Prophet Muhammad to be properly investigated. There were angry protests outside the school on Thursday and a further protest on Friday. The school has suspended the teacher and started an investigation. But parents, including some of Muslim pupils, say the protests and threats against the school are unhelpful. Any and all such threats to the school and staff involved undermine our efforts and are completely contrary to our values as concerned parents, citizens and Muslims. We therefore call for calm and to allow further fruitful dialogue and space for a transparent investigation to be undertaken. Salvage teams trying to free the cargo ship still blocking the Suez Canal are hoping this evening's high tide as well as more tugs and dredging will dislodge it. With hundreds of vessels stuck either side of the ship, Egypt's president says they should prepare to lift containers off to lighten the load. Our correspondent Helena Wilkinson has this report. It's still stuck. This huge container vessel remains stubborn, refusing to move. 14 tugboats have been used to pull and push this 400 metre long ship. They've managed a small victory, moving it 30 degrees. Sand has also been dredged to try to dislodge it, and water has now started running underneath it. But at some point, probably soon, they may have to bring in specialist equipment, including cranes, to start removing containers. The Ever Given got stuck on Tuesday. This satellite image shows the wedged container ship and around it more than 300 cargo ships that are waiting. One boat's refusal to budge has crippled global supply chains, 12% of which pass through this canal. It's billions of trade held up every single day. So it's a huge effect on global economy and it's affecting a lot of different supply chains. So we do have fuel tankers there, a lot of oil going through the sewers every single day. And we also have a lot of container vessels and we have bulk cargo, so that would be grains or coal and these sort of things. So it does affect us very, very widely. The worry now is that if tugboats and dredging don't manage to shift this ship, a complex operation to remove containers may be needed, an operation that could last weeks. Helena Wilkinson, BBC News. England's cricketers have ended their tour of India with a tense, very tight match that will decide the one-day series. After a poor start to their innings, chasing 330 runs to win, they battled to the very end. Drew Savage reports. England back themselves to match whatever India's batsmen could throw at them. But to begin with, the home side dominated. They reached 100 easily. So England turned to spin. Yes. What a beauty. Adil Rashid made the breakthrough, and then Moeen Ali. Yes. Oh, got him! India's captain Kohli gone for seven. But a partnership between Hardik Pandya and Rishabh Pant swung the match back towards the hosts. He's belted it as well. Pant had 78 and was looking set for more when Joss Butler took a captain's catch. India eventually bowled out for 329. But England's hopes of repeating Friday's run chase faded quickly. Roy and Bairstow both out cheaply. And when Ben Stokes holed out for 35, that victory target looked a long way off. The man in form, Ben Stokes, goes. England's middle order provided some resistance. The first one-day 50 for Dawid Malan. But he was out soon after, and England more or less on the plane home. Sam Curran and Adil Rashid battled on, but once Rashid was out, it looked like it was all over. Drew Savage, BBC News. And in the last few minutes, England have lost by seven runs. That's it from us. We're back with the late news at 10 tonight. Now on BBC One Time for the news, wherever you are. Goodbye.